Cairo, Seattle. This is your last meal. I'm your host, Rachel Bell, and every episode I interview a celebrity about what they would eat for their last meal. Then we explore the history of that food, the culture of that food, and whatever else we can cram into 30 minutes. Today on the program, Matthew Inman, creator, cartoonist, and writer of the extremely popular humorous webcomic, The Oatmeal. Do you eat oatmeal? Do you like oatmeal? Uh, No and no. We'll also hear from a legendary sushi chef, Shiro Kashiba, who at 76 years old still works behind a sushi bar five days a week. Why don't you retire? Because serving sushi is uh, my retirement. I'm enjoying doing Matthew Inman really tapped into something with his comics about cats and poop and bears and sriracha. Millions of people read his comics every month. He also created the game Exploding Kittens in 2015, which still remains the most backed Kickstarter project of all time. Matthew's also a long distance runner, so he launched Beat the Blurch. It's a 10K race for people who like running while also eating Nutella sandwiches and giant supermarket sheet cake and occasionally resting on couches. In a nutshell, I wrote a comic about distance running where I described why I run. And one of the reasons I run is this imaginary little overweight cherub with wings who chases me called the Blurch. And I've always said the Blurch is kind of my spirit animal. And if he catches me, I'll become him because I was really overweight when I was a kid and I struggled with it. And then when I got into running and working out, that all changed. So I created a race, a marathon, where you could literally and figuratively be chased by the Blurch. Uh, So we have people in Blurch costumes who run around. What does a blurch look like? um, Picture like a big doughy ball with wings uh, and like love handles and it it looks pretty bad. It's hard to describe. I'm imagining like the marshmallow man Mm -hmm. and then the Pillsbury Doughboy and then just some little wings on that. With a little bit of like Tim Burton in there. Hollow eyes. Yes. Yes, that exactly. It's a 10K half and a full marathon where you can run and there's cake at every aid station. So if you want to blurch out, you can. There's couches everywhere. <laughs> we had donut eating contests. How so, much barfing is there at this race? There's a lot. And actually, <laughs> on, the full, on the full marathon, there's seven bridges that you cross. It's okay. a beautiful race. But the second bridge is quite beautiful. You look out and there's this valley. Um, and it's the most popular vomit bridge. So usually if you hang out by that one, it seems to be the prime spot to throw up the cake and the beer. and Barf the, bridge. Yeah, it's the barf bridge. So if you do the race... Bridge number two is where it's at. So you're a serious runner. Do you eat cake and Nutella sandwiches along the way, or do you leave that to the other people and laugh at them as they barf? I've done this race enough times, I leave it to the other people. You know, I maybe take a bite, but I'm I'm good. It's like the cheap cake, like the sugary whatever sugar bomb. Yeah, like the big sheet cake from the grocery store. Yeah, and I run it in a blurch costume, an inflatable blurch suit. Uh Uh-huh. So typically I'm dealing with like a number of other problems, like chafing and dehydration. Matthew used to be a web developer and web designer, like so many people here in Seattle. But eventually he craved more creative control. The whole make my logo bigger, make the logo pink, that kind of thing. I've been doing that my entire career and I was tired of it. So I built a website where I wouldn't have to answer to anyone, where I could work from home, not have a boss and just run it exactly how I wanted to run it. And that website was actually an online dating website called Mingle2. Um, what was Mingle One? Uh, Mingle One was already registered, is what it was. So <laughs> I went with two. He started writing nerdy quizzes to attract people to the dating website. Like, how much of a geek are you? And you answer a bunch of questions about Star Trek and whatever, astronomy. And so I started creating quizzes like that to get the word out about my site. And it worked. I had 100,000 people using it in a month. And then within six months, I had a million users. And then Matthew sold the dating website and found himself back in the rut of working under someone's thumb. So just for fun, Matthew drew a comic called How to Tell If Your Cat is Plotting to Kill You. You should Google it. Because this is the comic that Matthew put online and basically formed the oatmeal from. He put this one comic online, he was flooded with followers immediately, and the rest is history. The oatmeal was born. And if you've read the oatmeal before, you will notice that cats are a central theme to a lot of the oatmeal's comics. So I was really shocked to learn the following thing. Uh, I don't have any cats. I have two dogs. You don't have any cats? Yeah, I know. Oh my God, I, I just know. pulled back the curtain and I can't believe what's I, behind it. I get this all the time. The okay. house fire we had, there was actually 17 cats living in that house when it burned down. Wow. And I was responsible for them and their litter box. So I think in terms of earning my due in cat, the cat world, I was the Shawshank Redemption of cat poop in my house and I suffered <laughs> through it. So um, The poop Sherpa. Yeah. I've actually been thinking about getting a tarantula lately. 
and I was going to name him Kittens. And then if people ask if I have a cat, I'm like, no, I have kittens. I just have kittens. So the house fire that Matthew just referred to is his childhood home that burned down when he was 11 years old. Like he said, his family had 17 cats and all of them died in the fire. Okay, that's not exactly true. They didn't all die. But I don't want to give the ending away to this amazing comic. You should go to The Oatmeal uh, and read it right now. It's called, well, not right now. You should go after you listen to this podcast. Uh, It's called When Your House is Burning Down, You Should Brush Your Teeth. And this was a comic that Matthew wrote on the 20th anniversary of that house fire. And this was a really significant cartoon for Matthew uh, because it was pretty much the first serious cartoon that he drew and wrote about the first time he decided to write about something personal rather than just the poop and the sriracha and the bears and the cats. And there's one other comic on the website that's really personal to Matthew that I was really struck by. I want to talk about one of your comics called How to Be Perfectly Unhappy. Uh, The idea of happiness in this country is just something that people are obsessed with. There's a million books and articles and every day kind of these BuzzFeed lists, you know, 29 ways to be happy. Uh, And you start this comic by saying that you're not happy. Can you kind of talk about your relationship with happiness versus unhappiness? Sure. You know, it, it starts with sort of how we define happiness in this world where it's binary. You're either happy or you're unhappy. There is no spectrum. And I hate looking at things in a binary way. I, I like spectrums. Like when I describe my day, I never say I've had a good day or a bad day. I say it was a 78% or 23%. I love gradients. And I look at happiness like that. I feel like I'm not happy or unhappy. I'm not lumped into these two categories. It is a giant whirlwind of feeling and thought that goes on. So... That, that's kind of how I, I started it, was explaining that I think you should look at it in a broader spectrum than those two things. The other thing is I don't define happiness as smiling a lot and feeling joyful a lot. I, I experience bliss, but that lasts about as long as a sneeze does, two, three, you know, and maybe at the most a couple minutes. So what I've found is better than trying to find this sort of permanent warm glow of joy that doesn't exist is I just do things that are meaningful to me. The 10 years ago, I got into running. And then a couple years ago, I got into ultra running where you run extreme distances. And it's it's one of the most painful sports you can do. I mean, you run for, for hours and hours and hours on end over mountains at high elevations. And it's incredibly painful and awful. And you're calorie deprived and alone and cold. And I'm not smiling when I'm doing that. And I'm not happy and I'm not joyful, but I am doing something incredibly meaningful to me. And that's become way more important to me than walking around with a grin on my face. Which would be creepy, (laughs) especially if you were running and losing toenails and still smiling about it. I agree. I agree. Uh, And running aside, I mean, there are much easier ways to do it. I I read a lot of books. I read a lot of comics. I I work a lot. Sometimes I spend, you know, 10, 12, 13 hours a day drawing. And, uh, you know, my brain hurts and my body hurts. But I, I find that by keeping myself interested and busy and, like I said before, doing things that are meaningful, that's way more important to me than um, trying to sort of attain this happiness thing that everybody's always talking about. And maybe I'm just different. Maybe everybody else is walking around in there smiling and feeling joyful, and I'm this sort of misaligned wretch who has no idea. But if that's the case, I've been this way since I was a kid, so I'm going to stay this way until I'm dead, so I might as well find peace with it. I think that most people are probably like you, but no one wants to admit it because I feel like we're all judged if we're not happy. Like, I think we feel uncomfortable when things aren't happy and fun all the time. Yeah, it's a kind of a brittle way of living, too, because you, you put on this this face that everything's great and everything's up. And you when you when you speak, you end in an up tone. Everything's great. And I'm, I'm like the down tone. <laughs> You're fun at a party. I had a sandwich to eat yesterday. It well, was, you should be happier about sandwiches. Sandwiches swear. are miracles. I agree with, with you. Miracle Whip in them sometimes. I made a comic about Miracle Whip, actually. You did? Yeah, it's called The Primary Difference Between Mayonnaise and Miracle Whip. And I, I sort of highlighted the difference, which is very clear in the comic. Well, what do you think the difference is? Gen- I know what I think the difference is. Yeah, like generally speaking, mayonnaise gives a sandwich kind of a moist sandwichy flavor. Yeah. And Miracle Whip gives it kind of like a goblin <laughs> flavor. <laughs> Very tangy. <laughs> how did you uh, realize, have you tasted goblin c- before? Is that how you were able to come to this conclusion? I'm speculating, but I'm pretty sure that's what it tastes like. <laughs> I'm sure you're getting that Matthew is a super smart dude, a very thoughtful person, someone who seems to really know himself and what he likes and what he likes to do in his life. And I think that his last meal definitely reflects all of those characteristics. And we will find out what Matthew Inman's last meal is after this break. We're back, and it's time to get hungry 
and a pair of chopsticks as we hear what Matthew Inman's last meal is. What would your last meal be? Okay, so I had this prepared and it was going to be a jar of peanut butter and a plate of sushi. And I don't want to mix the two. I eat peanut butter a lot and I put it on everything and I feel like it's a vessel for all food is just a vessel for me to eat peanut butter. Last night I listened to your episode with Dan Savage and you're good in the peanut butter department. I know when you said peanut butter, I was like, no, no, don't worry. We're going to skip it. (laughs) Uh, I did my homework. We're skipping that one. I just I felt guilty not mentioning my true love on the air as peanut butter. Because it could be listening. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Matthew, crunchy or creamy? I have to know. Oh, crunchy. Crunchy, yeah. Um, yeah, there's peanut butter and then there's the imposter peanut butter, and I go with the peanut butter. Um, so we'll go with sushi. Rather than just broadly going for sushi, there are three particular types of sushi. If it were my last meal, I would just eat these. Um, number one is freshwater eel, unagi. It's one of the sushi that I ate for the first time that I thought was just disgusting because mm. the texture is like, it's almost like cake, but you're eating an eel, which an eel, it's like a giant, awful looking snake monster. So you're kind of grappling with the texture and the fact that you're eating this terrible thing. And uh, it's now one of my favorites. I crave it. I, I've had it in Japan. I've had it here. Steve Jobs actually was a, a devout vegan um, to the point where he actually was like starving himself in the 80s, eating nothing but apples. The only exception he ever made was when he went to Japan, he would eat unagi. Um, so it had a special place in his heart and a special place in mine. Wow, that's interesting. I wonder why. I don't know. Part of the reason, too, why I like it so much, and it's it's kind of evil, is that it's not sustainable. So... Every time you eat some unagi, there's like one fewer of these things in the world. So it comes with this immense immense guilt of like, I'm eating this thing that I should not be eating because it's not that much left of it. Weirdly enough, even though it's it's from Japan and it's a Japanese dish, most of it comes from the northeast of the United States. So you can farm it, but you can't create the spawn pools. So they spawn out in the ocean and then all the little little eel babies, which are like these little glass slivers, you know, thousands of them, they swim up these rivers in I think Maine. And then they are harvested and sold back to Japan for like, massive amounts of money. But yeah, so that would be sushi number one. So do you laugh maniacally every time you eat one? It's more like... One less eel in the world. (laughs) More like sad little eel tears. (laughs) Guilty eating. Yes. So that's number one. Number two is um, otoro, fatty tuna. You can get that here. Basically just tuna nigiri, but with a little extra fat on it. There's this weird old buffet in Japan that I went to a lot when I was there. You can select the amount of fat you have on the fish. And so it ranges from 100 yen, which is about a dollar, to 800 yen, which is $8 a piece. And the more expensive it is, the the fattier it is. And I tried all eight, and the one is not enough. It doesn't have that sort of buttery flavor. And the eight was just like, you know, if a fish had liposuction and you put it in a bag, that's what you're drinking (laughs) or eating. Not good. Fish fat. Yeah, it was bad. So the six was, was my ideal. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. And the last one is... I don't. I actually wonder if I would want this for my last meal because it varies so much on which one you get. But uh, it's it's uni. It's sea urchin, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's the kind of yellowish blobby thing wrapped in seaweed. Yes. So it's really divisive. For one, because for people who don't eat sushi, even or for people that do eat sushi, trying this is just pure ocean in your mouth. I mean, it is salty, briny. You know, if you're the type of person who's like, I don't like the flavor of fish, you will you'd hate this. It's so funky. I think of it as the cheese of the sea. It almost has a little weird, like, funky cheese flavor to it sometimes to me. I never thought about that. Yeah, cheese. I've always said a really good one is sweet, but it actually tastes a little bit like cheese. A good one does. So it's, yeah. it, it really varies because a good one tastes like sweet cheese, whatever, and a bad one just tastes like mermaid vagina or something. It's just the most horrible thing you've ever put in your mouth. So it's a toss up. So my last meal, it might be like, oh, you know, do I want to <laughs> die with that flavor in my mouth? I was just thinking like if there were any mermen listening, they'd be like, I like that taste. <laughs> Don't talk about my girlfriend like that. <laughs> the other thing that's kind of interesting about uni, too, is when you eat it, you know, an urchin is a sharp, spiny thing. They crack open and they feed you the innards. What you're eating when you're eating the uni is actually the reproductive organs of that animal. Okay, that makes sense because it does have that feel about it. It's very sensual and strange and you put it in your mouth and it feels like, am I supposed to be eating this? When you put it in your mouth and you're feeling that, there's actually a way to tell if it's a male or a female. Um, The female is more like a a squishy, it makes sense, it's more like a squishy soft thing and the male texture is almost like cake, like a spongy tofu texture. So that's, that's a urchin lady parts and urchin dude parts depending on the texture. Wow. 
That is so interesting. Uni is also one of those foods where you think, who decided that this was something we could eat? Because like you said, it's like this big, spiky, medieval weapon looking thing. Uh, and I can't imagine who thought that you could get in there and then eat the reproductive organs. The whole thing is strange. Yeah, I've always thought that way about milk, actually. Yeah. I mean, I know it's obvious, but like, who was the first guy to go up to a cow and be like, grab that thing and squeeze it and drink it? And let's make some yogurt later. Like, I didn't know how that happened. People are so grossed out by the idea of eating breast milk when you're not a baby, but then we eat the breast milk of every other animal. I know. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. So just to recap, Matthew chose three different types of sushi for his last meal. First was unagi, which is broiled eel that the sushi chef paints with a sort of sweet teriyaki style sauce. Uh, The next was otoro, which is fatty tuna belly. And the last is uni, which is sea urchin. I'm really excited we're doing a sushi episode. I think everybody loves sushi. I didn't know anything about the history of sushi. uh, But when we come back, you will learn the history of sushi with Shiro Kashiba. He is a 76-year-old sushi chef who apprenticed under famous Tokyo sushi master Jiro Ono. Did you ever see that documentary on Netflix? It's called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Well, that is the Jiro we're talking about, the greatest sushi chef in the world. And we get to talk to his apprentice when we come back. Shiro Kashiba is an international treasure, and we are so lucky to have him here in Seattle. Chef Shiro, I don't know if I'm supposed to call him uh, Shiro-san or if that's weird because I am a white lady who's not from Japan. I'm not really sure how to address him, but I want to be respectful because he is somebody to be respected. Can I, should I just call him Shiro-san? I, I think so. I don't know if just calling him Shiro is disrespectful. I don't know the technical Japanese custom. I heard him call Jiro, Jiro-san. Every time he talked about him, he had a, he added the respectful son. But I don't know if like he's allowed because they work together. I did call him Shiro-san when he was here, and he seemed to like it. He smiled. Okay. It was like a real smile. It wasn't an I hate you smile. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're doing, silly boy. Okay, so if uh, this goes wrong, it's producer Aaron's fault. Wait, what? Shiro-san, that felt weird, has been a sushi chef for more than 50 years, almost 60 years now, and he was actually Seattle's very first sushi chef. It's really hard to imagine this city, any city in America, not serving sushi, but that was the case at the time. He currently owns a restaurant called Sushi Kashiba in Seattle's Pike Place Market, and he even had a small part on the 1990s television show Northern Exposure, playing a sushi chef in one episode. But back in the 1950s in Tokyo, he apprenticed under Jiro Ono, the now 91-year-old chef made famous by the documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And Jiro still works behind the sushi bar to this day. Uh, You opened a restaurant last year. I'm sure a lot of people say, why don't you retire? Uh, Why don't you retire? Because serving sushi is uh, my retirement, you know. I'm enjoying doing so it's okay. And uh, Sukiyabashi, Jiro, he's uh, 91 years old, still serving sushi. Every time I go back to Japan and I talk to him, he said, don't retire. I cannot retire. He's uh, 91. I'm uh, still 76, you know. <laughs> he's still your boss. You still have to listen to him. Yes, yes. Shiro says he wanted to be a sushi chef since he was four years old. His family put a little money aside so they could go out for sushi every now and then. And Shiro admired the sushi chefs. Whoa, that's hard to say. (laughs) Shiro admired the sushi chefs behind the counter. Uh, And so he wanted to be a sushi. My, my, my. Hmm. And when he got into high school, he became even more serious about his future career. Uh, But his dad made him finish high school before taking on an apprenticeship. I came from uh, Kyoto in Japan. And after high school, I went to Tokyo for sushi apprenticeship. It was my dream. And that was a very famous sushi restaurant called Yoshino. It was very famous. And at that time, uh, Mr. Ono Jiro, Famous Jiro-san. He works for Yoshino. And I work with him about a year, year and a half. Then I work for them about the six and a half years. My time, six and a half years apprenticeship, that's not enough. But uh, I already have a plan to go some Western country. That's my dream too. So I wrote a lot of letters to the United States Sushi Restaurant and the Europe, 
And uh, I got a few reply from them, but uh, you should study more sushi. Then please call me up. And I work hard at uh, uh, that time at Yoshino. And uh, fortunately, uh, my customer who visit Seattle, I asked him. Actually, I didn't know where the Seattle was, but still I like to come to the United States. So I talked with him and he negotiated to a Tanaka restaurant in Seattle. That was a 1966, December 1st. And you were Seattle's first sushi chef, is that right? Actually, yes, that's right. But Edomai style sushi. Shiro says that Edomai style sushi is only about 100 years old. Edo, that meaning is old Tokyo. Mai, that meaning is front. The front of Tokyo, that they have a bay. We call it Edo Bay. Cur- current name is uh, Tokyo Bay. Then they start to get the fresh, freshest fish from Edo Bay. And uh, so chef uh, buy uh, fish directly from the fisherman. And they have a portable cart. And they make a sushi, and they start to sell the Edomai-style sushi. Shiro serves Edomai-style sushi at his restaurant, uh, but since we're not in Tokyo, he says the word takes on a slightly different meaning. So Edomai now means sushi served in front of the customer uh, instead of in front of the bay. Uh, That means at the sushi counter, not prepared back in a kitchen. And the sushi counter is where Shiro still works. That's the place he will press a hand roll directly into your palm or serve you just a couple of pieces of nigiri at a time, explaining each piece and telling you how to eat it. And most people who come to his restaurant and sit at the bar order omokase style. That means basically, I'll leave it up to you in Japanese. It's chef's choice. You sit at the counter, you sit back and you let him bring you whatever he wants. And the food actually never stops. I went and did omokase at his restaurant, and you have to tell them to stop. Otherwise, they'll just bring you piece by piece by piece. And you think that you wouldn't fill up because it's just little pieces of sushi. But after about, I don't know, 15, 16 (laughs) courses, you start to get full. What do you think of all the trendy sushi, the really big rolls and using ingredients, you know, mango and different sauces and tempura frying, the whole roll. What do you think about Because you you do more of the traditional um, yes. edomai yes. sushi. Yeah. I think uh, those are fusions, we call it fusion style sushi. That is, uh, I think I started from the United States. So I really don't know history of the California roll and the spicy tuna roll, some other kind of a big roll. I have to serve like a California roll. We are on the menu, but still uh, I don't put any avocado in. Why not? It, uh, kind of a little resistance for <laughs> to use the other. Can you talk about the proper way to eat sushi? I think uh, in the United States, we like to add a lot of wasabi and mix it into our soy sauce. And uh, should we even be dipping it all into soy sauce? Uh, you know, usually we put the wasabi in the sushi in between rice and uh, uh, that fish, in between, we call it net, neta or tane. So customer like uh, more wasabi, they ask us more wasabi in the sushi. And soy sauce is supposed to be clear. When we eat a sashimi, there are two ways to eat sashimi. But the sashimi, that meaning is uh, no rice, just a plain sliced fish. So some customer wasabi mix with the soy sauce and dip and eat. The recently, some customer put a little portion of wasabi on the fish, then dip the little soy and eat together. But uh, for sushi, uh, we make a light, less salt soy, which we call nikiri sauce. We brush it on, and I told customer. You don't need any soy sauce. I think you should try this out. Next time you go out for sushi, particularly if it's a very high-quality sushi restaurant, try not to use soy sauce. Try not to use wasabi just for one bite if you can do it to see what the roll tastes like uh, and to taste how the sushi chef intended it to taste. What about chopsticks versus using your hands? The first sushi is like like a portable counter. Then everybody used the finger. So it was a finger sushi. And the sushi served at the, in the restaurant, then start to use a chopstick. So either way, both 
at the sushi counter, but the table, I suggest them to use a chopstick. That's better than to use a finger. But at the counter, usually uh, have a little napkin for cleaning the finger. So at the counter, yeah, both way, customer is always right, you know. So <laughs> chopstick or a finger, doesn't matter. Customer have to enjoy. That's the main things. I love it because Japanese people are known for being very polite. But when you eat ramen, you get to slurp and make a lot of noise. <laughs> and then you get to eat sushi with your fingers. These things that, you know, we're not supposed to do here. It's not polite. So that's I fun know, to go to Japan. It's so much more fun to slurp and eat with your Um, What do you like about sitting across the bar from somebody and, and doing the hand-to-hand sushi trade-off? Oh, I like to see a customer face, you know, and smiling and uh I like to introduce a uh, good sushi for any customer that uh, my retirement. And you have jokes too. You're making jokes. <laughs> Joke? no. I hear your jokes. I'm serious all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Love Can we have a joke? Oh yeah. One. Yeah, what is do what is a sushi bar joke? I served the last piece of tamago. This is the sushi sayonara. So as much as Shiro loves to be face-to-face with his customers, Matthew does not. Most of the time, people come up to me at a con or book signing, and they're like, you're funny, you're hilarious. And I, I know how to respond to that. Like, okay, yes, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. But after the running comic and some of these other ones that were a bit more, uh, less silly... Um, people would come up to me and say things like, I read your running comic two years ago and I started running and I've lost 80 pounds. It changed my life. They're like almost in tears talking to me and I'm like, I don't, cannot compute what emotions, what do I do? <laughs> now you're like a Tony Robbins to them. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm the worst. You hear me talk. I'm the worst inspirational. I'm not inspirational. I'm, I'm, I'm a misanthropic curmudgeonly man who just happens to be 34. Who lives in a jar of peanut butter down <laughs> yeah. by the river. Yeah. I just want to be like, no, no, don't. Do not look to me as inspiration. I'm a nightmare, you know. I don't know how to deal with that. It, it's nice, but I'm not, um, I'm better when they tell me I'm funny. Because then, you know, if they tell me that, you know, oh, it, I was going through a, a depressing time and I was suicidal and I read your comic about XYZ. And it made You're me like, feel cool. Better. I'm like, neat. Do you want a cat drawing? <laughs> Who wants a kitty cat? I'm like a balloon animal guy in person. <laughs> I have nothing else. This is why I actually try to limit my physical in-person interaction with my readers. I feel like they will like me better if they don't meet me um, because I, I'm not what they expect. And uh, I think my online persona is smarter than my in-person persona. So I try to cultivate that one instead. It's hard to listen to Matthew talk this way because I found him to be super personable. He makes excellent eye contact. He has something to say about everything. He's a great interview. He's a super nice dude. Uh, but his opinion of himself seems so different than the opinion I have of him and probably the opinion a lot of people have of him. Uh, But the one thing we can both agree on is our disdain for a certain word. Have you always been into food? Because you do have the food tab on your website and you have a lot of comics about food. I think so. Because we now know you're a liar about cats. So we don't know (laughs) if you're also a liar about food. Yeah, no, I I, unlike the cat thing, uh, I do eat a ton and I am a big food person. I think the word people who say the word foodie out loud need to be fired into the sun. But that aside, I would say I'm a food person. Thank you for saying that. I feel the same way. Doing this podcast and being a food writer, people always are like, oh, my God, you're a foodie. And I don't I I, my whole body starts breaking down. I just don't know what to say to them. Yeah, it falls right in line with people who use the namaste hashtag. (laughs) I just want to hit them with a shovel. Kind of on a similar note. I keep saying this. I made a comic about I made a comic about the word moist. I don't know if you read that one. Uh, I didn't, but we all hate that word. It was basically a flow chart on when it is acceptable to use the word moist. And it's only when talking about cake or towelettes. That's it. (laughs) Yes. Those little paper moist towelettes. Yeah, moist towelettes. Fine. I'm like, my hands are sticky. Moist towelette. Totally fine. Anything else, don't say moist out loud. Unacceptable. Yeah. And that was Matthew Inman's last meal. Matthew Inman is the creator of the Oatmeal website, the Exploding Kittens game, and the Beat the Blurch race, which you can sign up for right now. The race is September 16th and 17th in Seattle. Even if you don't live here, you can participate. Go to his website. It's beattheblurch.com. Thank you so much to the lovely Shiro Kashiba, chef owner of Seattle's Sushi Kashiba. And P.S., just to come back real quick to the whole debate over whether I should call Shiro Kashiba by his first name, if I should call him Shiro-san, Chef Kashiba, maybe you were yelling at me going, dude, you can call him whatever you want. 
Well, if that was you, you are correct, because I sent a quick email to Ed over at Sushi Kashiba, and he said, Chef Shiro Kashiba or Chef Kashiba is totally fine. So I emailed back and said, would it be sort of weird to just call him Shiro-san? And he said, that totally works as well. So the answer is, I can call him whatever I want. If you would like to weigh in on this or make any comments about this podcast or any of the others, uh, you can tweet me at I'm Rachel Bell. I am R-A-C-H-E-L-B-E-L-L-E. This episode was produced by Aaron Mason and myself and music as always by Prom Queen. And if you've been listening or this is your first episode and you like what you hear, if you have just a second to write a review of the podcast or even to subscribe to it, we would be so grateful. It actually helps a lot. It gets new people listening to the podcast and that is a good thing. I'm Rachel Bell, and until next time, this is your last meal. Oh, 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 oh